Thank you for choosing CTN. And now, it's time with Herman and Sharon. I love you. Hi, everybody. The name is Homan. <laughs> that English Holman? guy. That's Holman. right. Homan. I know. I want you to watch this. This will do better than a thousand words. Hmm. And the fellow that you will see is actually here in person. But I want you to see his brilliance better than I can explain it. Watch. Do you know this story in America's history? Well, after America's revolution, France had a revolution. But where our founders had repeated references to faith, France turned away from Christian faith. After George Washington's two terms in office, John Adams was elected the second president of the United States. The situation in France had changed. There was a French Revolution and an atheistic reign of terror. In Paris, Robespierre headed up the Committee of Public Safety, which accused, arrested, and then beheaded 40,000 of the businessmen, the wealthy, the royalty, including King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. All churches were closed and religious monuments destroyed. Graves were desecrated, crosses were forbidden, public and private worship was outlawed, and Christian education outlawed. Priests and ministers and those who harbored them were executed on sight, all in an intentional campaign to de-Christianize French society, replacing it with a civic religion of state worship. Hundreds of thousands were killed throughout France, especially in the religious area called the Vendée. French privateers ignored treaties and then in 1798 had seized nearly 300 American ships bound for British ports. Talleyrand, the French foreign minister of affairs, demanded millions of dollars in bribes in order for them to leave the American ships alone. Known as the XYZ affair, the American Commission of Charles Pinckney, John Marshall, and Eldbridge Jerry refused to pay the extortion fee. The cry went out across America, millions for defense, but not one cent for tribute. As America and France came close to war, President John Adams asked George Washington, now retired at Mount Vernon, to again be the commander of the American army. Washington agreed, writing on July 13, 1798, Satisfied you have exhausted to the last drop the cup of reconciliation, we can, with pure hearts, appeal to heaven for the justice of our cause and may confidently trust the final result to that kind providence who has heretofore and so often signally favored the people of these United States. Feeling how incumbent it is upon every person to contribute at all times to his country's welfare and especially in a moment like the present, when everything we hold dear and sacred is so seriously threatened, I have finally determined to accept the commission of Commander-in-Chief. President John Adams declared a day of fasting on March 23, 1798, and again March 6, 1799, saying, The people of the United States are still held in jeopardy by the insidious acts of a foreign nation as well as by the dissemination among them of those principles subversive to the religious, moral, and social obligations, referring to the French infidelity that was infecting the campuses of the universities in America. John Adams went on to say, I hereby recommend the day of solemn humiliation and fasting and prayer, that the citizens call to mind our numerous offenses against the Most High God, confess them before Him with the sincerest penitence, implore His pardoning mercy, through the great mediator and redeemer for our past transgressions, and that through the grace of his Holy Spirit, we may be disposed and enabled to yield a more suitable obedience to his righteous requisition. Righteousness exalteth the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Well, the prayers of the country were answered, and a second great awakening revival spread across America. And there were universities being formed and hospitals and medical clinics and a missionary movement that went from Hawaii to Burma and all kinds of American Bible Society, American Tract Society and different denominations being started. So where France 
had a revolution that was turning away from the Christian faith. America had a revolution that began with Christian faith and afterwards had a second Great Awakening revival. America is unique in world history and especially for its faith. And it's important for us to remember these miracles in American history. William J. Federer, there he is in person, a That's former great. congressional candidate and has appeared on hundreds of radio and television interviews mm -hmm. and my personal friend. <laughs> Oh, mine too, okay. Herman and Sharon. You're, you're great friends, and yeah, I appreciate you. If you get one of these, let me tell you, there are, on this particular one, there are 20 different segments, and it is the most well done, mm -hmm. and you had a little taste of it right there, that if you get a DVD, go to that website, and by the way, if you go to that website, I just pulled some of these off of my shelf. <laughs> I've got stacks of his books. I mean, just stacks of them. I, I, and if you go to his website, you can get them too. And the problem is, as I was just telling him, I said, I hoard his books because many times I'll have guests in my office and I go, you know, that, that would be great if he had a Federer book. <laughs> and once in a while I go over to, to my shelf and pull one off and I said, you would really love to read what you're just talking about. This book has that. And just recently, I gave one of these to a fellow that was working on our sprinkler system. Irma just messed up everything we had in our home. <laughs> Hurricane Irma. Yes, Hurricane Irma. <laughs> yeah, it is. Right. Irma stopped by and, and, get, and, and cost right. me about five grand. But anyway, he was standing there, and, and, and he, he's talking about he liked history, and I just shared Christ with him. And he said, uh, yeah, you know, yeah, I used to believe like that. And I said, well, let me tell you, I said, Jesus Christ changed my life. I said, that's, that, that's the mark of my life. It, he changed it. And so he said, I love history. He's talking about that. Sharon was talking to him for a while. So I started, you know, because we had everything rearranged in our house. And I thought, Lord, help me to find that book. So I went to my room. I knew it wasn't in there. As soon as I walked in my room, went out to the garage. She had put a lot of my books in one of those see-through containers. Mm -hmm. And I pulled the, something that was laying on top of it. And there it was laying right on top. And I go, thank you, Lord. So I went walked in and it, it had been signed to me by, by, by uh, uh, William and, and, it, and, it had, and I go, okay, this is signed to me, I don't care. Okay, so I said, by the way, my name's in there, this is your gift, and he started looking through it and he was just mesmerized, mm -hmm. greatest book. So, I mean, go to his website, any book you choose, this guy covers it, unbelievable. But anyway, I love the DVD though. That is, oh, uh, that is. when did that come out? Um, probably about uh, six months ago. Wow, that's and great. Then we have another one that we're just coming You're out. You're doing with, a, th a third volume one. three. Yes, and so they're taking these stories. My wife has heard me speak for 30 years, and she decided to pick out the best stories, and they're ones where there's a crisis, they pray, and things turn around. Yeah. Yes, right. And I, I would write long, and she'd say, make it shorter, make it shorter, and so we finally Good whittled them down to a real short segment. Un unfortunately, France didn't have that same Great Awakening, did it? No, as a matter of fact, every communist revolution used the French Revolution as its model. Really? That you, you kill off, and tear down the statues of all the, the St. Genevieve, she was a young woman that got all. What did you just say, tear down, tear down the, the statues? Tear down the statues, what we're yeah, doing we right now. How that happen? Right, so, so in France, uh, St. Genevieve was the young woman that got Paris to fast and pray, so Attila the Hun skipped Paris and they had a statue in her, they destroyed her grave during the French Revolution. Wow. Uh, the same thing when um, Lenin took over Russia, des destroyed, uh, the statues and changed uh, St. Petersburg to Leningrad. So it's this idea, it's called deconstruction, where you separate a people from their past, That's get right. them into a neutral where they don't remember where they came from, and then you brainwash them into the future you have planned for them. Wow. And it's actually a sales technique. If I was a toothpaste salesman, the first thing I would do is say negative things about the toothpaste you're currently using. You're still using that old stuff, it'll eat the enamel off your teeth. Ooh, you're repulsed by it. Now I got you into a neutral, you're sort of open-minded, what are all the toothpaste out there nowadays? And then I can give you my pitch for this brand new tartar control breath freshener stuff. So they go into the classrooms and they tell the kids negative things about the founding fathers. They took yeah. land from Indians, sold people into slavery, and the students are repulsed by them. Now you got the kids into a neutral, they're sort of open-minded, what are all the beliefs out there nowadays? And then you can give them your pitch for socialism or LGBT or Islam. 
And so we see Europe went through a Judeo-Christian past, right? Catholic cathedrals, Protestant Reformation, you know, Jewish neighborhoods. Then Europe went into a secular neutral with the French Revolution and Napoleon spreading all this French secularism around and secularism says anything goes, free sex and, you know, LGBT. And now Europe is entering an Islamic future with Mohammed being the number one name for newborns in London, Milan and Brussels. So we see a car goes from drive, neutral, reverse. We've gone from Bibles in the schools to condoms in the schools. Now it's hijabs in the schools. And so we see the gay the secular agenda is just a transition phase. It's a creative way to cut ties with the Christian past, but it's quickly co-opted by fundamental Islam. And so, or communism. In China's case, they had a cultural revolution and destroyed all their history right under Mao Zedong, killed 80 million people. And then they had this mass of uneducated young people that they could brainwash into the People's Republic of China. Sort of gene therapy for a culture. You take out the old identity of the culture and then you put in a new DNA. Uh, but we have, for all the faults the Founding Fathers had, they gave us a country where we're in charge. So the most common form of government in world history is a king, Pharaoh, Caesar, Kaiser, Sultan, Tsar. And you plot them out, they go from small to bigger to bigger. So you have Nimrod, Tower of Babel, Gilgamesh, king of Uruk, and Sargon of Akkadia conquered from the Persian Gulf to the Mediterranean. 2,000 years of Egyptian pharaohs, and then Cyrus of Persia, right? And then mm -hmm. Darius, and then Alexander the Great had the biggest empire, then the Romans had a bigger one, and then Attila the Hun had a bigger one, and then finally Genghis Khan conquered from Korea to Hungary, killed 30 million people. But then you have the maritime empires of Spain and Portugal and finally England. So the king of England was like a globalist. Uh, he had the largest empire and America's founders decided we didn't like this one king ruling like a pyramid and his will is the law. Our founders decided to flip it and make the people the king. So we pledge allegiance to the flag. We're basically pledging allegiance to us being in charge of ourselves. So when somebody protests the flag, what they're effectively saying is I don't want to be the king anymore. It's like, okay, somebody else will dictate your life if you're not gonna, not gonna participate in it. So we're basically, uh, for all the faults the founders had, they gave us a country where we, the people, are the king. And uh, we get to pursue the God-given calls on our life. So how can it be taken over though? I mean, s some way, even though we're the king well, of the you, country. What you do, you start by electing <laughs> Democrats. <laughs> okay, well, I'm just saying, you know, uh, is there a way to take it away from us without us even knowing it, though, even with the Constitution? And yeah, so there's philosophers, Machiavelli, Hegel, Karl Marx, Solinsky, and they said, well, gee, in times of crises, people are willing to give up some of their freedoms to get past the crises. And so they said, let's speed this up. Let's send in agitators, agent provocateurs, provoking agents, community organizers, labor organizers, and they would find people with grievances and stir them up to riot until there's lawlessness and chaos, and then everybody surrenders their freedom. But that would never happen here. <laughs> People surrender yeah. their freedom <clears throat> to some government leader that promises to fix it. He collects all the guns, and yeah, he restores order. But when the dust settles, you just transition from the people ruling from the bottom up back to a king ruling from the top down. Yeah. Forty-five countries fell to communism that way. They would send their organizers in and organize the proletariat against the bourgeois, which is the working class against the business owners. They'd organize the blacks against the whites, the Muslims against the Christians. They organized the Hutus against the Tutsis in the Congo and Rwanda. They really don't care who the races are or what the issues are. They just want a destabilizing crisis. And they don't give up. I mean, you know, it's almost like they're never going to give up of trying to, to change the system. Look at what they're doing to the Boy Scouts now. Yeah. Yeah, I was that, an Eagle Scout. The, I'm, and that, so that's that's the end of Boy Scouts. I'm so proud of John Stemberger, and he started Trail Life. Uh, he's a friend oh. of mine, he, uh, um, an attorney, and he was upset that they had co-opted the, the Boy Scouts to push the homosexual agenda, and so he started Trail Life. And so I uh, am using my recommendations for people to move in that direction if they have young boys. And yes, it's, it's, it was very disheartening to me to having mm -hmm. been an Eagle Scout and a Scoutmaster uh, wow. myself and to see it being pushed with this uh, alternative agenda. Why do you think they're doing it? Why do you think they're doing it, combining them like that? Well, when you uh, see the, the bigger picture, you have to uh, pull the, uh, there's a spectrum of power. One side's total government with a king. The other side's no government, which would be anarchy, unless the people had internal morals like everybody downloads a behavioral app on their iPhone. <laughs> Instead of GPS, it tells you how to act. But wait a second, why would you follow an internal moral? Well, ancient Israel had the key ingredient. There is a God watching everyone. He wants you to be fair, and he's going to hold you accountable in the future. 
So you're about to steal, nobody's around, and then you think, wait a second, God is watching me. He wants me to be fair. He's going to hold me accountable. Maybe I should hesitate stealing. Create something in your head called a conscience. So if everybody in the country believes there's this God, everybody is, is motivated to keep these yeah. internal morals, and you can have complete order with no policemen following everybody around. Maximum liberty. Now, it only works with the God of the Bible. An Islamic Allah God says there's an infidel woman there, nobody's around, you can rape her, it's okay. The God of the Bible says do unto others as you have them doing to you. But if you get rid of this God, all you have is rules. Why follow them? Some will, but some won't. And those that won't give in to their passions and lust, and it turns into chaos. And once there's chaos, people say we need somebody to restore order, and that's when the rubber band snaps back to a king. So yeah. if you are in a republic and you want to move it in the direction of a king, that's you what have we're to supposed to be. Yes. Uh, uh, you have to get rid of God, get rid of internal morals, and you want to encourage people giving. So ancient Israel, the first 400 years out of Egypt, it was a republic. Yeah. And so the, Moses says, how can I alone judge the people? Take you, wise men, known among your tribes, and bring them to me, and I'll recognize them. So the people choose their own tribal leaders and said, okay, Moses here. And so for 400 years, it went this way until the priests stopped teaching the law and the high priest Eli, his own sons are sleeping with women in the tent of meeting. Uh, there's the story of a Levite with a graven image in the house of a guy named Micah and the tribe of Dan comes along and says, you can be a priest to our whole tribe. And you're scratching your head thinking, what's this priest doing with a graven image? They're not teaching yeah. the law anymore. And then there's this Levite with a concubine traveling. The law says the Levite is to marry a virgin of his own tribe. Here he is with the woman he's not even married to and they're traveling in a house surrounded by sodomites. They bang on the door. He shoves the poor girl out. It's a terrible story. She gets yeah. raped and dies. He cuts her body in 12 pieces, sends it to the 12 tribes. They come together, kill the sodomites, and by the time you're grossed out, you read this line, every man did what was right in their own eyes. Mm -hmm. And then that total domestic chaos, they go to Samuel. They said, this system is not working. We want to be like all the other countries. We want a king. And so when the internal morals are gone, there's chaos, and out of chaos, you go back to a king. So are we on the way to a king? Uh, that's the, <laughs> so if you track it, uh, yeah. Over. Another Democrat in, if Hillary would have gotten in. <laughs> Will you stop, It please? is over. <laughs> I feel like we, we have re experienced a reprieve from that agenda being implemented. Yeah. But nevertheless, it's still there, and uh, when you see uh, different uh, disruptions taking place around the country. Um, the, I was talking to Ed Meese, a former attorney general for yeah. Ronald Reagan. He says whenever they do uh, rioting, uh, the former administration would send somebody in that would take over the local police departments. That's right. And instead of the sheriff looking down to those that elected him, he's now looking up that he might be accused of some federal crime. And it's a polarity change. Yep. Again, from the bottom up to a top down, from the mm -hmm. people ruling to a king ruling. That's right. And, uh, and so, and now, let's say he's in eight years. Will that be time to change anything? Because uh, you, you've got you've got the even the Republicans that hate him, mm -hmm. President Trump. I'm talking about, and so they're not going along because their little s sandbox is being disturbed. They've been used to thirty years being re-elected, 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 and now he's in saying he's going to drain the swamp, and they're part of the swamp. So will eight years even make a difference? I think it's a reprieve. It reminds me of Israel when Manasseh was this wicked king sacrificing his children to Molech, mm -hmm. you know, and the prophets go to Manasseh and says, it's over, God's fed up. Well, Manasseh has a grandson named Josiah. He's eight years old, becomes the king, 16 years old, starts to seek the Lord, 20 years old, tells him to clean out the temple. They find the old dusty scrolls. It's the law. They read it to the king. He rips his garments and repents. They send to a prophetess in town named Holda, And she said, tell the man that sent you that judgment will come, but not during his lifetime, because he repented. So for the rest of the 31 year reign of Josiah, there's peace and prosperity and great big, huge Passover. And he sends the Levites to teach the law while well, he dies. It goes down the drain and uh, you got Zedekiah and the king of Babylon comes and takes him captive. And so I feel like in America, we've aborted so many babies. A just yeah. God has to judge. If, if, there's, if the blood of uh, mm -hmm. Abel cries out for judgment, That's right. then it's 60 million babies. And so, so a just God has to judge us. But if we repent, he might, he might put it off. And so, um, but, um, but that's, you know, one of the other things I uh, point out uh, I talk about ancient Israel and how it fell, but another was ancient Greece. 
And so Plato lived uh, 380 BC, and he said that the city government would go through five stages. The first stage he called rule of the capable, and these are people that know how to run farms and businesses, they're really responsible, they know how to run city governments. They do a good job, the city grows. He called them lovers of principle and truth. A second group wants to get involved in politics. Plato called them lovers of fame. These are people that don't know how to run anything, they just got famous. Maybe like a Hollywood action figure that gets elected governor of California. Yes. Right? Oh, yes. What did he run before yeah. he became, not even a, a village, not even a bit, he was just famous. And so Plato says these famous people love fame so much that they'll sacrifice anything to not be defamed. And so uh, they will be manipulated by public opinion. So first ones will do what's right, second ones will bend based on public opinion. And Plato says that since they don't have practical knowledge running stuff, they'll do financially irresponsible stuff. They'll vote money out of the treasury to pad their retirement. They'll vote money to send to, send to some brother-in-law's construction company. They'll, they'll, you'll, they'll use the, all their perks to, to buy votes. And before you know it, it turns into a third category. Plato called them lovers of money. And they use their position to benefit. And you see most congressmen go in poor, come out millionaires. It's yes. like, how did they do that? Yeah, exactly. and, um, and then they funnel money to supporters so that they can vote them back in. And, and uh, Plato says that the people end up getting upset and they vote the bums out and they set up a democracy. And he says a democracy is the most charming form of government. Their chief characteristic is lovers of tolerance and they learn how to tolerate each other. And it's, he says it's like an embroidery patchwork with lots of colors, like a bazaar, you go down and buy any viewpoints, it's really great. And then they tolerate people that are a little bit off. Then they tolerate people that are a lot off till finally they're tolerating crooks and crimes and fraud and all kinds of terrible things and nobody cares. And Plato even says that the young man gives into libertinism and useless and unnecessary pleasures, even incest and un unnatural union. Wow. Yes, that's what he's talking about. Same thing that happened at the end of the Israeli experiment of ruling themselves. And so they get into this lawlessness. And then he says that the people begin to vote money out of the treasury. Now the treasury's empty. The people say, where's more money? The rich people, they vote to take all the money from the rich people. Now there's no rich people left. And then they have a shortage and they don't have enough to go around. And so they begin to say, well, don't cut back on what I'm used to getting. The other group says, well, don't cut back on what I'm used to getting. Mm -hmm. And it turns into bickering and fighting. And then they begin to say, can't somebody come along and fix this mess? And that's when somebody comes along, smiles, promises to fix it. They yield all their rights and freedoms. And uh, then they begin to see this guy's getting a little too powerful. And they have a choice. This person has a choice. He needs to give up the power or get rid of the people confronting him. And he ends up purging his administration of anybody with morals and virtue because all he wants is yes men. And then finally he stands in the chariot of state holding the reins of power and he's revealed as the tyrant. So democracy without virtue ends in domestic chaos out of which people surrender their freedoms and a tyrant arises. Now we were on track pretty close to following that. And again, I feel like we've experienced a reprieve from that agenda being implemented. But as you mentioned, what comes next? Maybe four years, maybe eight years, and if there's some big national crises, we could be this close to having some leader saying, you know what, we're just gonna take away everybody's guns. And when that happens, historically, every country that fell to communism, the first thing they did was they took away the, Hitler disarmed the Jews before he threw the Jews in the gas chambers, right? So you, you yeah. um, and so uh, anyway, didn't mean to get into all that, but uh, our form of government without a king is based on the people having morals and virtues. What Israel had that Greece didn't was the God of the Bible. Greece just told the people to be moral for virtuous for virtuous sake. And that what didn't, uh, Plato said, people really don't have virtue because if you give them a choice of giving up their life or giving up their virtue, they'll always give up their virtue to save their life. Wow. Right. He even said, if someone was ever born that truly had virtue, he would so convict the world that the world would crucify him. He said that in Plato 380 said BC. That. It's Plato. Actually, it actually says crucify him. In 380 BC, Plato said that. Wow, isn't that something? George Washington was asked to be king, wasn't he? He was. He was amazing because um, two times, once when he was the commander of the army, he could have been king. Mm -hmm. And second, the Constitution did not limit the, the president to two terms. That only came after FDR got elected four times, yeah. believe it or not. But the president's only served two terms out of respect for Washington. So he served twice and that's enough, I'm going back to my farm. So he said, and there was a famous story of Benjamin West was a painter, born in America, but he was a British citizen. So he's in England painting the portrait of King George III 
after the, the, uh, the war's over. And, you know, there's old portraits, too. you got to stand there for a long time. So the king's making conversation. He says, well, to Benjamin West, uh, what does this Washington say he's going to do now that he has defeated the king's army? Benjamin West said, well, they said, Your Highness, that he's going to go back to his farm. The king stops and he says, if he does that, he truly will be the greatest man in the world. You see, kings killed to get power, kings mm -hmm. killed to keep, keep power. It. Washington had the power. He defeated the most powerful military, the king of England. He was the, and he goes back to his farm. Mm -hmm. right? And so he was following, there was a, a Roman, before Rome got an emperor named Julius Caesar, it was a republic. And during the republic, there was a guy named Cincinnatus. And he was on his farm and they get him in, they're being attacked, and he becomes a dictator for a year. He gets the victory, he goes back to his farm. Then he's 80 years old, Rome is attacked again. They say, hey, come on back. He's a dictator for another year. After he wins the, the battle, he goes back to his farm. And this idea was that it's more noble to give up power rather than to covet it. And so that started the, the military men after the revolution started the Order of Cincinnati. And Cincinnati, Ohio is named after the guy. Wow. And this idea that, you know, Washington says the sword is the last thing to pick up and the first thing to put down. And, um, and so Washington really was a, a great example. And again, he set the tone that other leaders had, but we're moving in the direction of people wanting to covet that power. So, uh, so we need a revival. And yes. I think that uh, God loves us. And the more you love someone, the more you want that someone to love you back. God loves us infinitely. He has an infinite desire for us to love him back. He doesn't need our love any more than parents don't need to have kids, but they sort of want to have kids and they want to pour their love into the kid and they don't expect the kid to pay him back, but they would like a little attention, a little affection, maybe a little kiss on the cheek, right? And so God loves us and he, he really wants us to love him back. What's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God. But the thing is, love by definition cannot be forced. Right. The very moment he forces us to love him, it's no longer love. So he puts the tree in the garden, says, Adam and Eve, don't eat from it, but it's your choice. Yeah. Here's the children of Israel, the law, here's the blessings, here's the cursings. Please choose life, but it's your choice. So you bring the horse to the water, you can't make it drink. So mm -hmm. he wants us to love him really bad, but he can't force us, right? So it's like um, if a husband twists his wife's arm and says, tell me you love me. No matter what she says, she doesn't love him. But if he woos her and courts her and, and gives her flowers and chocolates and he defends her and protects her and provides for her and out of the abundance of the heart, she says, I love you. Then it means something. So that's what mm -hmm. God's after. It's not after this Islamic, you know, submit or I chop your head off. He's after this mystical thing of you and your heart voluntarily. So since he can't force us to love him because the moment he forces us, it's no longer love. He, he has two motivations, positive, negative. The positive is he blesses us so much. We turn to him out of gratefulness. That doesn't work. There's plan B. He withholds the blessings. We turn to him out of desperation. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Don't like plan B. <laughs> That's the message. Jesus Christ is the answer to every need you may have. Amen. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching It's Time. If you have recently made a decision for Christ, Herman and Sharon would like to hear from you.